Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everybody's having a good Wednesday. I don't know about y'all, but I'm pretty exhausted for whatever reason. So, uh, but like I said last lecture, so um, yeah, next week we have a little bit of a break to try to you know catch up and relax a little bit. Obviously, you still have to deal with you know family and friends and all that kind of stuff for Thanksgiving, but at least somewhat of a break for you know classes and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, as always, I just want to kind of make this general reminder that if you have any questions about any of the assignments or anything like that, please do not hesitate to reach out. I'd rather have you ask me questions early on and where we can kind of fix things instead of after everything's been due and I can't really do much after that. So just keep that in mind. If you have any sort of thing that needs clarifying, don't hesitate to shoot me an email. I'll be usually pretty quick about responding back to you. Now, as always, I do want to kind of go through our Typical reminders, quiz 13 is due on Sunday, same time, same bat channel, all that kind of fun stuff. Again, one more after this one, and that one's not due until the week after next day. So you'll have two weeks technically to do it if you want. Honestly, I kind of expect that you'll probably take next week off, but that's just my thoughts. Um, don't forget that the Connecting with Biology assignment is due on December 1st, and there'll be kind of like a little mini bonus lecture that'll go with that after it all gets turned in and everything. You won't have to watch it for the final, but it was be there for you if you're curious about how all these different ethograms worked out and all that kind of fun stuff. As for the identification when it comes to connecting with Bio3, don't feel like you have to have it perfect. I don't expect y'all to know every single different type of bird, lizard, whatever. If you want me to help you identify, I'm happy to do that. But if you just want to like put it out to the world and let iNaturalist take care of it, that's fine too. So just do your best to try to get it close and then let everybody else deal with it. So she asked if we need to take pictures or videos of the entire observation time period. You can if you want to. However, when it comes down to it, ultimately all I need is just the single picture to prove that there was actually something there in the first place. And again, it's just a because it's it's pretty easy to just go out there and just cross a bunch of boxes off, but you have to actually show me that you interacted with some sort of animal. Just to kind of verify things. Yeah. If the animal we're observing kind of like leaves and comes back to the next 10 minutes, is that okay? Yeah, that's totally fine. He asked if the animal moves in and out of your reference space where you can't see it. Um, do you can you still count that? And that's totally okay. Because that's just gonna be how it is sometimes. And it's a and that's one of the reasons why there's that other category of like, yeah, that animal's gone and I have no idea what's going on. So yeah. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Is the Google form all we need to do, or does it also have to do a Word document? So it's it's two parts. Um, when you turn in connecting with Bio3, obviously you're going to fill out that Google form. And what that allows me to do is actually put everything into a big master Excel spreadsheet, and I can actually do the data analysis from there. But the rest of it is more so like I need a Word document that has like that little text box that you know has all your little boxes clicked on what it did, as well as you know the weather, time, date, what it was, that kind of thing. Yes. Um, so she asked, "What? How does there? Can this animal be domesticated?" And in this case, no. Um, the one caveat I will put to this is, if you're at a zoo or an aquarium or something like that, I'll let you include something like that, just because that's not an animal that you personally know. The big thing is I just want to remove domestics because they do act quite a bit differently, especially around humans. But zoo animals and stuff would be fair game. Um, in that case, though, if you do end up going that route, let me know. And you'll just include a picture. You won't include the blind actual stuff. Just because you shouldn't be turning in zoo animals and that stuff. That makes sense. And keep in mind, too, if it's just a free-roaming spider or bug in your house or lizard, as we have with all the little geckos, that's fair game, too. So. But you know, there's plenty of lizards, there's plenty of squirrels still just out roaming around. Park your butt on a bench somewhere and just watch them for 10 minutes and you're good. Any other questions, real quick, about connecting with Bio3? It's a fun assignment. It's not supposed to be anything super heavy duty. And to be honest, it'll be really cool when we can pull all this information together and see just the differences in how these animals interact with each other or with each, or just with their species, that kind of thing. So one last thing I'll mention. Um, don't forget that the extra credit for exam four is also due on December 3rd. That's to give us a little bit of lead time to actually turn it around and double check everything before the final exam. 
mostly because it's also that you know one pager field. We just don't have as much. It's not. It takes a little bit more time to check it and make sure everything's good. But I've been really impressed with the ones that I've seen. I even saw somebody where they, I don't know if you realize this, but they cited something that I wrote, which was kind of cool. But not to you know pat myself on the back too much, but <laughs> have some fun with it. Learn something cool about a species that you're not super familiar with. It's kind of why I had that whole sign up thing. If I didn't, everybody would pick black bear or otter or something like that. It's super charismatic. And let's be real here. The charismatic stuff's nice, but it's not as cool as other things. And that's kind of something, kind of a nice lead way into what we're going to be talking about today. So real quick, before we get kind of past this administrative stuff, does anybody have any questions? Cool. Now, just as a reminder, don't forget that if I'm going a little bit too fast, slow me down. If you want me to re-explain something, I'm always happy to, okay? All right. So today we're gonna to be talking about preserving biodiversity. What does that mean? And kind of putting it in context of the word that you've probably all heard of before, conservation. What does that mean? Where does it come from? What's kind of the history of it, that sort of thing. And so this is going to be kind of a two part lecture we're going to focus on the first half of this uh, for today and we'll come back and talk about more on Friday. There's kind of two easy break points here so we'll try to it, we may end a little early today or we might go a little bit long we'll see hopefully it won't be either. Now, probably the most important thing to point out here is that humans have an impact on ecosystems around the world. They change a lot of different things. They alter some of the biogeochemical processes. They introduce pollutants. They introduce new species. All these different actions can have often a negative uh, effect on the biodiversity of a particular area. So for instance, in this example here, you've got an albatross. Really cool seabird. They have some of the longest wingspans of anything that flies still. But if you look, I know it's kind of a gruesome picture. On the inside of this bird, there's an absolute shit ton of plastics. There's a bit lighter, for instance, that kind of thing. Now, this is a bird that's going to be out ocean going, probably over some of the like Pacific uh, garbage patches and that sort of thing. So it is really important to highlight just all this crap, this stuff that's just bioaccumulated in this poor organism and ultimately causing it not to be able to feed properly. And, ultimately to see what happens. It's pretty clear that this was the cause of the bird's death. It ate too much plastic and died. But there's a lot of other ways that it's a lot harder to detect how humans impact the uh, So this probably will be a little bit of a downer lecture, so bear with me. Um, another great example of something like this is, I'm sure you've heard of the sea turtles and the plastic straws. We do live in Florida. It seems like a very popular topic around here. And while it can be somewhat comical, and people have even made entire videos about why, and music videos that are kind of a parody of why would sea turtles stick straws up their nose, um, it, it's kind of a nice way to highlight just the sheer amount of plastic trash that just ends up in the oceans. Now, the big thing I want to point out is this, you see this term biodiversity. This is simply just referring to the variety of life that exists on Earth. And you can kind of pigeonhole it and say the variety of life in this specific area, the variety of life across the entire globe, the variety of life just living inside of your gut microbiome, that sort of thing. Now, maintaining biodiversity is important since all organisms interact with each other. Remember when we we're talking about all the different food webs, how all these different connections are made. And then when you remove one of them, the whole thing collapsed. And we kind of look at it from three primary different levels. Obviously, you think of things like species when it comes to biodiversity, how many species, how even are they across the landscape, that sort of thing. Ecosystems make sense, right? You want to make sure there's a wide variety of different kinds of ecosystems out there, so you're not just, say, preserving only the biodiversity in one place. And finally, genetics, which is oftentimes kind of overlooked. For instance, uh, there was a really cool seminar that happened on Monday where UCF brought in a person that worked with Florida Panthers. Now, it's easy to kind of get lost on the species and ecosystem side, but one of the things that kind of came up with uh, these poor Florida panthers is that because of inbreeding and a lot of other just kind of 
fraction of their population, their genetics were absolutely awful. And as a result, they had things like cryptorganism, which is where the testes don't descend properly. And so obviously they can't be produced properly. Pink tails, cowlicks that show up in weird spots in their back. And all these are just signs that these animals are extremely unhealthy and not doing well. And so one of the things that they did, that was the whole point of the seminar, was talking about uh, when they brought in a couple females from Texas that had the most genetically equivalent to the population here in Florida, introduced them into our population and let them interbreed. So that way you could introduce new genes and new alleles that weren't present in that kind of crappy inbred population. And it's something called genetic rescue. And you can see how even the genetics side and the species side can really interact a lot when it comes to preserving biodiversity. Now, obviously, we've mentioned a couple times now, genetic diversity is the amount of variation that exists within a species. So kind of coming back to uh, those like Hardy Weinberg equilibrium examples and that sort of thing, what you're ultimately looking at is the proportion of all these different genotypes and trying to understand what kind of frequencies are present up there. Say, for instance, um, in this particular example, you have three different possible genotypes with either a dominant or a recessive, you know, just your classic genetic example. And so what we would do to kind of figure out how many of these different genotypes are out there is we do the number of big Bs, the number of little Bs, and the number of big little Bs. We can use that, and that all should, as a proportion, add up to one, because obviously the whole population is one, right? So having a variety of alleles present in a population is essential in order for these populations to adapt and continue to change. In other words, you can't evolve if you don't have options. That's the whole point. That's one of those huge um, assumptions that's needed for evolution to happen, right? You need a situation where an organism has a different set of options that it can go with either A or B. Now, most have that, but after extreme inbreeding depression or extreme population bottlenecks, you may lose that entirely, especially if you're talking about like 20 individuals, which happens quite regularly when you're talking about mammals or birds. Like we talked about previously, species diversity is simply the number of species that occupy that biosphere. So, you know, the more species and new system arguably the healthier and more flexible that ecosystem can be, because there's more options for that food web, right? It's all still interconnected, but it's not going to be as susceptible if you remove one, compared to, say, for instance, if you only got 10 individuals, if you remove one of them, that's a pretty, you know, you're losing 10% of that population. But if you've got 100 individuals and you remove one species, you're, you still have 99% of that population that can still hang on and do okay. Now, speciation, that adaptive radiation and extinction rates, are going to determine that level of species diversity in the ecosystem. In other words, how many new species are showing up versus how many species are being removed. This is often, it's pretty easy to think about this from a more geological time scale, something like millions of years instead of like a couple hundred thousand. But even then, a couple, you know, tens of thousands of years are enough to see entire ecosystems change. For instance, how many of y'all have ever heard of a passing division? Okay, a couple of y'all. At one point in time in the US, the passenger pigeon was the most prevalent bird found anywhere, with flocks that were literally billions strong that could cover the entirety of UCF for days as they flew over. Massive populations. Gone by 1903. The last one died in the zoo in 1970. And you can see just Granted, humans had a huge effect on that whole system, but you know, even big, massive populations of a single species can be wiped out and completely change the ecosystem as a result. And finally, ecosystem diversity, which means the variety of ecosystems on Earth. Obviously, it gets pretty boring because it's all forests or all Arctic or all desert. And so having those different varieties of habitats is just as important. Unfortunately, as we've kind of been alluding to a couple times here, Earth's biodiversity is massively decreasing. And one of the ways we monitor species diversity is just to count how many species are at risk of extinction or have gone extinct in, say, like the last hundred years or so. 
Now, as we mentioned before, extinction just simply means that the last of that individual has perished. And keep in mind, there's some kind of like sub definitions of this, like you can have extinct in the wild, where they may be in zoos, but they're gone everywhere else, <clears throat> or functionally extinct, which is where you may only have a couple males left that are still out there, or you know, basically from a genetics perspective, it's one animal, even though it may be two or three. So at that point, they're just so inbred, they're going to die out no matter what you do. And in fact, it can be kind of devastating to see this in your life. Um, Kind of a blessing and a curse of something that I've got to personally interact with is in 2005 or so, the Atlanta Botanical Garden went down into Costa Rica to do what they called the frog savior mission. What was happening is there was a disease called contrivia mycosis that was literally wiping out every single frog species in these tiny little montane streams in Costa Rica, Panama, and a couple of other places. And as the disease moved through, it literally killed off entire species and entire families of species. Now, Atlanta Botanical Garden went out there to try to save some of them, but they weren't entirely successful. They were able to bring in probably 20 or 30 species. Some of them they got to survive and got to get them to reproduce, but it's not always the case. In fact, they had one called the, it's like the Frabslin uh, tree frog. It's a really cool frog. They're about that big around. Um, they had special uh, webbing in their toes that allowed them to glide down from the treetops. Really cool looking frog. We saw the last one of them. It had been living in a box, and been well taken care of, mind you, but you know, living in a box for six years after the last other individual of its species, another male, passed away. So in other words, we got to see the last of the species of its kind just sitting here in a box in Atlanta, and you knew it was going to go extinct. It was just a matter of time. Kind of dark to see. And it's important to kind of point these examples out. Now, I think other things that we can look at to kind of factor into this stuff is things like endangered species. So, how, animals that have an extremely high risk of extinction in, say, the next 100 years, or vulnerable species, which is likely to become extinct in the more distant future, something like a thousand to 10,000 years. So, if you're kind of factoring what's endangered versus what's vulnerable, it's kind of a time scale thing. So are you looking a thousand years out or are you looking a hundred years out? Now, one thing I do want to point out, and it's kind of sad on my end, the percentage of threatened and endangered species when it comes to vertebrates, amphibians are the hardest hit. Disease alone accounts for 20% of extinctions or endangerments in the last 15, 20 years, which is kind of dark to think about. And you think about COVID or other human diseases, chytridiomycosis makes them look like a child. It just wipes through everything. It kills everything. But of course, we have birds and mammals and other reptiles and bony fish, all of this stuff has been wiped out. And a lot of this has to do with things like islands. And if you start with a small population, it's really easily pretty easy to wipe stuff out. Probably one of the saddest examples of this is on the island of Guam. There's somewhere between 20 to 30 bird species that have gone extinct in the last 30 years. <laughs> Seven of those alone are due to a, light, or a lighthouse keeper's cat that just by itself wiped out seven different species of birds. Keep that in mind the next time you let your just cat go out free ranging. And as you can see pretty clearly, Earth is having a biodiversity crisis right now. Um, we're currently in what they call the sixth largest mass extinction. It's called the Anthropocene. Um, and we're currently expecting somewhere between 20 to 50% of all vertebrate life to go extinct over the next thousand years. And we're already lost quite a bit. How many of y'all have ever heard of the stellar sea cow? Really cool animal. It's basically a giant manatee that was 30 feet long. Those were off the coast until about the early 1900s when all of them were killed off and used for food for people that were moving back and forth between Europe and North America. There's a lot of these little stories. And I try to highlight some of these to show you that we've lost a lot even in the last 100 years or so. Now, unfortunately, a lot of these losses over the last, say, 10,000 years are pretty much attributable to humans. 
That's the only group that we can really find that consistently has changed climate, destroyed habitats, introduced new diseases or new species entirely, all this kind of fun stuff. And you can see just you know, based off of this, which is um, basically the darker dwarf vibrant colors that create a form and make it more human impact compared to lower human impact when you get down to those cooler colors. Um, basically, where populations have been and are continuing to grow are having massive implications for all these different species that are found there. Probably some of the worst areas currently hit with issues with biodiversity are currently China and India. Because there's billions of people there. They have to live somewhere, they have to support themselves somehow. And unfortunately, especially when you've seen the rise of China's middle class, there's some things like some of the traditional Chinese medicine that's kind of pretty prevalent throughout the southeastern part of Asia that's resulted in mass killings and over harvesting of elephants, rhinos, tigers, bear cats, um, turtles. I think at the last I've heard, over a third of all turtle species are threatened or endangered as a direct result of over harvesting. Most just being shipped over to China to be eaten. In fact, we've had to go through the, or the point of, in the US, state by state, numerous states like Georgia and South Carolina and others have had to make special laws that heavily restrict how they do turtle harvesting as a direct result of basically contractors coming in, harvesting all the turtles they can possibly find. Shipping them on over boats over to China and getting that for turtle soup. And keep in mind that, you know, this wasn't the US that much longer ago either. Up until the 1970s, um, things like sea turtles, alligator snapping turtles, and all that stuff were regularly consumed in the US. Go for tortoises as well. Now, conservation biologists are the ones kind of tasked to look into these problems and try to understand how they're happening and that sort of thing. So they study how to best preserve biodiversity. Now keep in mind, conservation biologists aren't just focused on the science and the biology side of things. They often incorporate sociological-based studies or psychological-based studies to look at how humans interact with the earth and how humans interact with their environments. Because honestly, the most important thing when it comes to preserving biodiversity is understanding how to keep people from destroying what they have. And especially in places like Madagascar, the Congo, um, parts of the Amazon, you know, you're not going to give a shit about conservation if you're starving or your family's starving. So understanding how to go into these situations and work with the people that are living on the land and give them more options. That's a big part of conservation biology, too. Now, ultimately, humans are at the root of a lot of these main causes of biodiversity loss. Things like habitat loss and destruction, invasive species, populations of humans just in general, pollution, and of course, overexploitation. You can see a lot of different examples of this. Now, keep in mind with uh, habitat loss, it's not always just for you know putting in farm plots and things like that. Even just you know tearing things down to put in solar panels, wind turbines, all that stuff that occurs out west that we don't necessarily think about as necessarily destructive activities do cause a lot of damage to the ecosystems around them. So that kind of stuff needs to be factored in when we're considering where's the best place to put some of this green infrastructure. We'll just get the quicker questions and go on that. So let's talk about the history of conservation here in the US. This conservation really is kind of an American idea. It's come out of a lot of really cool and inventive people, both men and women, for the last 100, 150 years or so, maybe 100 years, that saw the massive decline in population of animals and plants across North America and realized they should probably do something about it. And so we're going to talk about some of these individuals and what their contributions were and how they kind of came to this thought process of oh, maybe we should actually give a shit. Uh, just to kind of put it into perspective and see where we've come from as kind of a line of conservation biologists. So we're going to start in the 1800s and work our way through the 1950s. So the conservation movement, and this is really documented in a really cool book called Dreamers of the Fitters, and it had a number of key figures pretty early on 
people like Henry David Thoreau, Frederick Law Olmsted, Hubert Pinchot, John Muir, and Aldo Leopold. And don't worry, we're going to go through each one of these individuals and what their contributions were as well. And then later on, we're going to talk about some other or people that were heavily influential in the 1950s through the 2000s, people like our very own Marjorie Stone Douglas and Rachel Carson, who were heavily involved in pushing conservation and resulting in these massive, you know, really groundbreaking laws, things like the Endangered Species Act. Clean Water, Water Act, the Clean Air Act, all that kind of fun stuff that appeared around the 60s and 70s. Now, the whole idea from of conservation kind of came out of a weird kind of offshoot of religion called transcendentalism. And it really started with David Thoreau, who lived in 1817 to 1862. I'm sure some of y'all have probably been stuck reading Walton Pond at some point. If you, if you haven't, I don't know, it's not the end of the world. But the big thing with Thoreau was a lot of his writing was about kind of getting back to nature and understanding what's going on. And the thing to keep in mind here with this is during this time period, you kind of have two schools of thought, one coming more from Europe, another coming more from the US, where Europe was a lot more focused on aristocracy and the noble classes and all this kind of fun stuff. Whereas in North America, because of just how we were founded and how our country was structured, a lot more of what we focus on as colonies and now ultimately a new country was how do we interact with the natural world? And so he basically spent most of his time living in a tiny little cabin, recording the things that he saw at Walden Pond and kind of meditating on it, often with a religious bent, but still something rather interesting there. And ultimately he wrote extensively during this day and published Walden in 1854. This is arguably one of the first pieces of true conservation literature that we've ever seen. Now, the big thing with Thoreau's philosophy is he thought about things like civil disobedience, and that in wilderness, the preservation of the world comes from that. And by saving the wilderness, that we could save the, you know, humans as a, as a result. And nature brings up the best in people. A lot of these things kind of get echoed and kind of continue on till nowadays where you look at books like the last child in the woods that talks about as we've kind of moved into this modern age of computers and cities that we need to make sure we're going out and interacting with nature still one of the reasons why i kind of push some of these connecting and biology assignments to push you to just go out and see what's out there even in suburban habitats you can still see animals you can see how they're interacting with their world Now, when it comes to um, Frederick Law Olmsted, he was a landscape architect. And a lot of what he was thinking about was how humans are, can use the world and still have a connection to nature, even in these more city landscapes. Now, he tried out a lot of different professions at first, including running his father's farm, and moved back and forth between Europe and England constantly, trying to kind of get a foothold on life. But I like to point that out just because. You know, y'all are college students. Some of y'all probably swapped majors before. Just want to point out that you don't have to know exactly what you're doing to start. But the big thing he's probably most famous for is the creation of Central Park in New York City. In 1853, New York City set aside a wide variety of land that was kind of crappy, just not really usable. So Olmsted won a competition in 1857 to design it into a usable space that people that were living in this industrial, urbanized center of New York would go out and still interact with nature. Bringing in elements of some of the stuff that Thoreau talked about, you know, you should be interacting with nature. That's how you get back to being a human, right? And arguably, this had massive impacts. Here, you have your original design in 1857, mind you. You know, there's no electricity. All this stuff is kind of there. That boat you see over here is powered by steam. Here's what it looks like today ish. And, and you can see that lasting impact that this one individual had just to set aside a little bit of nature in a fairly urbanized area so that way humans didn't have to go that far for it. They could still have that connection back to nature. And his big philosophy that I want to point out is he was really focused on making this land available to the public. 
That's something that's really important when you talk about North America, especially or US history when it comes to conservation. A lot more of this is focused on public interactions and not like a lot of the European powers where they had these reserves that were only for the wealthy, only for the aristocracy. <coughs> this was for the people. And ultimately these social transformations, you know, keep in mind too, you have a lot of things like Marxism and all this kind of stuff bubbling up as well for the traditional progressivism, that kind of stuff that also interacts with a lot of these different concepts. So one kind of issue though that we ran into is that too few parks resulted in overcrowding and overuse in the future, the damage kind of the nature. And so maybe they need to look at bigger objectives and kind of putting more back into the nature side of things and less into the human structure side of it. That leads us to Gifford Pinchot, who was the first chief of the Division of Forestry in 1898. And he introduces us to the first kind of congelation of the concept of conservation. What does it mean to preserve the land? And keep in mind too, given that his, keep a, a big thing to point out, that prior to you know the 1890s, after the Civil War, you had entire groups that just went from state to state, often called carpetbaggers, that would, especially in the South, where it kind of had a lot, a loss of a lot of industry, that would go through and cut down every single last tree and use that for resources to build factories and stuff up in the north. Kind of, it, it was kind of treated as a punishment, if you will for all these people from the North to come down, raid all the resources in the South and take them back north. It's not exactly an ideal way to kind of finish up how shitty the Civil War ended in the first place. And as a result of that, we saw just massive clear cuts and loss of a ton of the biodiversity in the Southeast. And Pinchot's job was kind of to get some of this back, to start kind of utilizing the forests in a more sustainable, productive way Instead of just clear cutting everything and leaving, that was kind of his, his whole point. He thought that conservation is the natural resources must be developed and preserved for the benefit of many and not merely for the profit of a few. Think about today in terms of externalities, right? You don't want to just have one group who has a relatively small benefit from you know, selling off all this land. It's, forests, whatever, to destroy it for the, everybody else. And conservation means the greatest good, the greatest number for the longest time. And all this is a part of breaking new ground, which is one of his rights. He ultimately lived from 1865 to 1946, and he was a professional forester. He was responsible for managing these forests for sustained yield. And one of his most influential areas is the Biltmore Estate up in Asheville, where he was brought in by Cornelius Vanderbilt to properly manage the system and actually have it be as close as it can to be natural, but still be able to pull resources from it. And ultimately, he came up with these three goals of conservation. And that forestry is not just about the trees, it's about kind of taking care of the entire environment itself. And again, that greatest good for the greatest number for the longest time. Now, around the same time period, you have a man named John Muir, who was probably influential and got to interact with some very powerful people. He was a very interesting person, primarily a preacher, but he focused on the power, kind of, it's kind of a mix between Pinchot and uh, where's it speaking today, um, Thoreau, where he's kind of got that more existential, but there's just value in nature for nature's sake. And ultimately he kind of started out as just a general person kind of doing the whole regular life thing. And when he got injured in an accident, he realized that, you know, maybe there's more important things to life. So in 1892, he founded something called the Sierra Club, which is still around to today. It's a very popular, uh, strong conservation group that's primarily responsible for kind of taking care of places, particularly out west in the Sierra uh, Mountains, but they do have effects out here as well. In 1896, he toured all the Western forests, writing about them, talking about their majesty, why they're important, that sort of thing. And as a result, 
He was a guide for Teddy Roosevelt when he was the president, showing them these places. And as a result of this whole interaction, this started the movement for the national parks, places like Yellowstone, places like Yosemite, which he was primarily responsible for. All this was kind of pushed because Muir and Teddy Roosevelt and all these other individuals were out looking on the landscape and saying, this is important, this needs to be protected. And ultimately he was a naturalist and preservationist. He thought that unlike Pinchot, we should preserve nature for nature's sake, not just for its resources that can be used later on down the line. And finally, when we're talking about kind of these big important individuals, the last person I want to point out is Aldo Leopold. Who's kind of the last on the late end of this kind of interaction with um, these kind of great conservationists. He was a probably the first wildlife biologist and was the founder for something called wildlife management, which is responsible for bringing things back like ducks and deer and all the stuff that we kind of take for granted today. All that stuff was pretty much wiped out prior to the 1950s. Now he grew up in Iowa and did his master's in Yale in forestry and ultimately graduated and went on to work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, or sorry, U.S. Forestry Service. In 1935, he founded the Wildlife or the Women of Society, which still exists and does a good job just kind of going out and looking at places that need to be preserved, as well as the Wildlife Society in 1937, which is still actively involved in wildlife management and wildlife research to make sure we understand how we can better protect, as well as better manage for their own sake, um, wild populations on the landscape. But probably the most important thing he's famous for is something called the Sand County Almanac. It's a great book, super easy to read, like 90 pages, but it basically just puts you into context for watching nature and understanding what happened over the course of an entire year, this one little tiny plot of land, and using that to kind of as the basis of talking about the importance of things like hunting and kind of the control on hunting to some extent too. A lot of these individuals oftentimes had this kind of thought process of, you shouldn't totally eliminate something, but you should be able to find kind of the balance between things. And that's where you kind of come into this whole concept of the land ethic. And ultimately, you learn three things that all rely around ecological conscience and stewardship. A great poem, it's only like 10 pages, and I really heavily encourage y'all to read, is called Thinking Like a Mountain. And the whole point of a lot of his writing is to get out of thinking like a human and thinking about things from an ecosystem or an ecological context. Now, obviously, this didn't all just end in the 1950s. Uh, we've had a lot of progression since then. And something that's kind of really interesting to point out is, you know, between up until the 1950s, a lot of the thought processes were much more focused on just humans directly impacting a piece of land or directly interacting with wildlife. But as we kind of moved into the age of chemicals and the ages of a rapid advancement post World War II, how we thought about conservation, how we approached it, radically changed as well. Specifically, this time period saw a, lot, a wide variety of laws enacted to better conserve and protect wild spaces. Things like the Endangered Species Act, which was signed in 1973 by the Republican Richard Nixon. I'd just like to point that out there that at one point, conservation and wildlife and all this stuff was a bipartisan issue. Things like the Clean Water and Clean Air Act. In the 1960s, the rivers and lakes, especially around um, the Great Lakes region, were disgusting. In fact, there was a river in Ohio that literally burned for 10 days straight because of the amount of pollutants just sitting on top of the water itself. And then you get things like NEPA, which is the National Environmental Policy Act, which kind of restricted even what the government could do and changed how we should approach things when it comes to writing things like environmental impact statements and making sure that we're accounting for more than just the understanding if development needs to be done for development's sake. And with these, you had a couple of major individuals that were incredibly important to some of the philosophies that ultimately underpinned all of these actions. People like Marjorie Southern Douglas, who was a columnist in the conservation here in South Florida. Probably her most seminal work was the uh, Everglades, the Rivers of Grass, 
which was gave per, uh, people a perspective on the land of Florida. Because obviously it's easy to see with places like the Appalachian Mountains or the Rocky Mountains, their beauty, right? It's not hard to miss that. But Florida is an interesting place. We have very interesting wildlife, interesting plant communities that can often be lost if you don't know what you're looking for. And so a big part of her work was to expose people to these things and show them why they're important. And a big point of this was showing how fresh flowing water was essential to both people and wildlife. Because keep in mind, up until like the 1950s, the, the concept behind a lot of our management was we should have power over nature, not trying to coexist with it. And, you know, there's a great book called The Swamp that talks about this kind of change in these attitudes from like the 1800s to 2000s. So Florida in particular is very influential in this. So up until the 40s and 50s, and arguably even still a little bit today, a lot of damming and ditching was done in South Florida to be able to drain it for development and have things like sugar cane or other, you know, kind of more tropical crops, things like mangoes, bananas, that sort of stuff. And all that was done kind of as a, who gives a shit about these giant grassy fields? They don't really matter. But as we've learned since then, you know, you have those large eutrophication events. Even up in Lake Apopka, that's the whole reason why that whole area is kind of cordoned off is because it's kind of a nasty lake. It's been not taken care of for the last 40, 50 years. And they're just now trying to get things back under control because of how we managed things prior to 1950. Now, I do want to point out that she wrote even more books about the Everglades um, and how we should protect it and was very influential in founding Everglades National Park in the 1950s. But of course, obviously we talked about kind of this mentality between controlling nature and versus living with it. But there's also something around the same time that we had issues with as well. And that's pollution into these environments, oftentimes not from even close to where that environment is. You know, we still see microplastics way up in the Arctic Ocean, even though people aren't necessarily dumping them there. It's just how things move around. Now, Rachel Carson was kind of the person that pointed out why this stuff is important. She wrote a book in 1962 called Silent Spring. How many of y'all have ever heard of it? The whole point of Silent Spring was to talk about how DDT, which mind you was the wonder chemical, it killed off all the mosquitoes in the world and you know, kept people safe from things like malaria and COVID fever. So it was really controversial when she said, oh yeah, we should not do that anymore because it's killing off all the birds. But I do like to point that out. And this notably launched that kind of nationwide push for environmental regulation in the 1960s and 70s. And ultimately, she was a strong proponent in education and connecting people back with nature. Kind of going back all the way to Thoreau, you see that strong kind of thought process held throughout all of this stuff. Now, this is kind of that traditional theory of conservation biology, which is kind of more set into stone in the 1985 by um, Richard Sewell, and kind of defined it as four chief principles of the field, which ultimately resulted in the creation of the Society for Conservation Biologists. You don't need to know too much of this stuff, so just I want to touch on it, but nothing too crazy. And ultimately, this frames conservation as humans as the guardians of nature. Their importance there. Here's those uh, main principles that I do want to mention here, though. Ultimately, conservation is about protecting nature against human influences, maintaining and conserve biodiversity in the planet, and to create places where nature can exist free of human influences. However, this was the established conservation biology as a cross disciplinary science, thinking between sciences of different backgrounds, not just the chemists, not just the traditional biologists, not just the ecologists, not just the sociologists or psychologists incorporating all these different fields together and bringing them together to address one big problem. And ultimately encourage conservation to focus on threatening rare species and biomes to protect them and keep them around as long as possible. How are there some criticisms here? Obviously you shouldn't be you know, removing people out of places. We're not, we don't wanna repeat what we saw in the 1700s, right? And this can be pretty easy to do if you think about it when you're trying to like preserve places in Madagascar or Amazon, that kind of thing. As well as 
Has there really been anywhere that hasn't been affected by human rights? Again, that's pretty much up to interpretation. There's some, even like way up here in the Arctic Ocean, way away from people, there's still human impacts to these species. Biomagnification, plastics, all that kind of stuff ends up there at some point. And finally, another thing that kind of gets ignored in this whole thing is that nature does have the ability to adapt to urban environments. And it portrays environments and species as weak, that we shouldn't kind of, it, basically it kind of treats them in kind of uh, infant, infant words. It, it treats them like child children, right? We're not actually, we're, we're too focused too much on, we know what's best for the environment, which isn't always the case. We have to make mistakes in this process. And this led to something called the new conservation movement. This theory originated out in 2003. It was formalized into a proper philosophy in 2012, which is um, basically used a parallel structure to soul using those four main principles and those four calls to action. And here's those principles here. Conservation must occur in human altered landscapes. Conservation will only succeed if people care. Argue, right? Conservation must work with corporations. That sounds a little bit counterintuitive, right? And conservation must not infringe on human rights and must embrace the principles of fairness and equality. You can see how this kind of comes into, especially a lot of the stuff we're dealing with nowadays and why some of this stuff might be important. This whole new conservation theory was exactly super popular. Um, there were major criticisms that arose from a wide variety of human sources including a former professor here at UCF that actually got removed from his post because of how vocal he was against it. Um, and there are definitely some arguments that can be made against how Kariva approached conservation, but there's also some benefits of how he looks at conservation too. And maybe between these two thought processes of how to interact with nature, maybe there's a little bit of you know both that can be used, right? Ultimately, numerous conservation organizations have shifted to this focus of new conservation theory because it works a lot better in our modern world, especially with concepts like social justice, because you know the last thing you want to do is deprive humans of rights too, right? And unfortunately, some of his tactics kind of got him removed from major conservation organizations like the Nature Conservancy. So even today, we're still arguing about these things, why they're important, how to go about them, all this kind of fun stuff. So the big picture I want you to take out about this whole concept of new conservation versus old conservation, traditional, however you want to put it, is that people are constantly still trying to figure out what is the best way to move forward. So that way we're not just losing everything. <clears throat> so it's actually a pretty good stopping point, actually. So we're going to go ahead and stop here for today. Uh, don't forget about all of our normal stuff. You know, everything is coming up. If you have questions, don't be afraid to reach out, all right? Thank you.